Hi, and welcome to MGT4520. This is International Entrepreneurship. My name is Dr. Matthew Pauly, and I will be the module leader for this course. I'm very much looking forward to sharing this information with you this semester. The intended learning outcomes for this course are divided into knowledge creation and skill attainment. For knowledge, we have three components. The first being identify and critically evaluate business opportunities that are available in the global marketplace. The second is critically assess the co concepts and techniques of international business and management to identify business opportunities. The third component to knowledge creation and knowledge understanding is to critically evaluate how planning, organizing and control activities impact a successful launch of a new business in international markets. The second aspect of this course is skill building, and that is four, utilize appropriate techniques to formulate strategic decisions to develop business opportunities internationally. Five, analyze data from multiple sources to make informed investment and management decisions when developing an international business opportunity. And number six, coordinate and integrate the planning, organizing and control activities to develop an international business opportunity. Collectively, with the intended learning outcomes you will see, you will find that critically shows up quite often. And what this means is I am looking for you to really look at the information, really use references and resources to support your ideas and create a depth of knowledge and understanding that you are going to be able to relate, not only in terms of international entrepreneurship, but use this knowledge and skills as you progress through your academic and practitioner careers. This is your learning planner for the course. The learning planner is divided into 13 weeks with lectures and seminars. The lecture column identifies the topics that we will be discussing in that class. The lecture column also corresponds with the textbook sections on the far right. For example, international entrepreneurship is section one in your international entrepreneurship textbook. The seminar we use for discussing and elaborating further on some of the questions that arise from each of the lectures and sections in the textbook. The seminar is an opportunity for you to really express your knowledge and talk about some of the things and examples that might come up and, and possibly some of the questions that you ne might need you know, answering by not only myself, but maybe some of your student colleagues as well. It's important to recognize that in the learning planner, not only in the learning planner, but to come prepared to both lectures and seminars and read the sections of the textbook and read the questions within the textbooks that way, when you come to seminars and lectures prepared, we are able to have more fuller, developed discussions. In this course, we have two forms of assessment. We have formative assessment and summative assessment. Formative assessment is verbal feedback. There is no grade associated with the feedback. It is simply comments and different aspects and views from me to you. It is important to note that formative feedback usually happens between the first and second week before a submission is due, and it is up to you to seek formative assessment feedback. Summative assessments are the numerical grade that you will receive for each assessment. In this course, we have two assessments, assessment one being a group challenge and assessment two being an individual report. So for both of these assessments, you will receive a numerical grade as a 100% scale that will, at the final, be converted into a 1 to 20 point Middlesex University scale. Assessment 1 is your group challenge and it is worth 30% of your overall grade. You will be tasked with forming a group or alternatively, the module leader, myself, will assign you to a group. The group will select a challenge only one challenge from the assessment one guide. The challenges look at contemporary international entrepreneurship opportunities or challenges that are currently presented in the marketplace. Your challenge will consist of compiling and creating a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation that is pre-recorded 
and submitted on the module page in the appropriate section. You will also be required to submit a group evaluation form to reflect how much each individual in your group has contributed to the overall delivery of the assessment. For example, if there are four students in a group and each of you does an equal job, then the a group evaluation form should reflect 25% contribution from each member. The group evaluation form is also another method to highlight if and when another individual does not contribute to your assignment. It is required that all students present on the group challenge. This means that I will need to visually see you as well as you identify yourself on the video on the presentation. This is not only for recognition for myself, but this is also to help with second graders who will be looking at your presentation and will not know who you are. Again, the first assessment is pre-recorded. You submit the assessment on the module page, and you can also put a link on YouTube if you wish to share with other friends, family, Assessment two is the individual report, which is worth 70% of your overall grade. This is an individual challenge, so each individual will be responsible for submitting their own work. Now, assessment two also has an assessment guide, which has a full breakdown of all of the information for this assessment. Individuals will select from contemporary international entrepreneurship opportunities or challenges that are currently presented in the marketplace. The individual report will be 1,000 words plus or minus 10% in Microsoft Word document that is submitted on Turnitin, which is on your module page. Again, there is an assessment guide that outlines everything that you need to know for assessment two. There is a 0% late submission policy in this class. I do not want you to miss deadlines. There are circumstances that come up which we can address privately but there is a 0% late submission policy. In the event that you do miss the deadline, you will have an opportunity to resubmit, but the maximum score allocation for a resubmission is 40%. Again, the maximum score you can receive on a resubmission past a deadline is 40%. As discussed earlier in the presentation, there are assessment guides for both assessment one and assessment two. Both of these assessment guides are located on your module page. The two most significant resources for this course are Middlesex University Library, as well as the International Entrepreneurship book by Robert Hirsch. You will have access to both. It is also worth noting that Middlesex University, in collaboration with myself, have developed an entrepreneurship library guide that can be accessed through Middlesex University Library website. There, you will find all of the information that is relevant and needed for the exercises in this course. That is not the only option for you to obtain secondary research, but it is a great resource that has a collection of information that is highly relevant to this course. At Middlesex University Library Online, you can also access the business resources, which are highly, highly relevant for this course and exercise. As noted earlier, especially if you are on an immigration visa, attendance is mandatory. So please come prepared, contribute in class, ask questions, and utilize this time with your group. I cannot stress enough that you are the people that make this course. And so the more questions, the more conversations that we have in class, the more depth of understanding that we can create. So some advice I can give you for this course is to be direct, be deliberate, express yourself, take chances, and try to use your imagination. This is not a typical business class. This is entrepreneurship. It's not like accounting, it's not like marketing, it's not like finance. Entrepreneurship is very much a way of thinking. And in this course, I'm hoping to push you to really challenge yourself and think critically and look outside the box at different answers, different opportunities, different ways of looking at business and creating business, both in a domestic context as well as an international context. So you might be asking yourself, what am I doing here? Why, why, why did I pick this course? Why did I pick this elective? 
international entrepreneurship? Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining this course. Thank you for taking this journey with me. And as I said in the previous slide, entrepreneurship is not a traditional business course. Entrepreneurship is a way of thinking that's not just relevant in this discipline. It's relevant in everyday life. You're going to analyze things critically. You're going to look at different opportunities that might arise. And remember, it's not just about starting businesses, either domestically or internationally. It's about recognizing opportunity in your lives. It's about questioning when people tell you things. You know, Is that right? Is that wrong? Can that be adapted? Now, a big part of international entrepreneurship is culture. It's about being adaptable. It's about being empathetic, understanding how people feel, how they behave, how they think. And another component of international entrepreneurship is really understanding the rules. Each country has its own political system, and it's up to us to figure out, depending on the country that we want to enter, what do those rules represent? And again, how do we start a business in those areas? How do we grow, merge, take over a business in those different countries? And the primary focus in this course is going to be looking at taking a micro or small business and starting it internationally. Conversely, we also have the opportunity of taking ideas and things that work in other countries and possibly using them here in London. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into what you are actually doing here. So when we look at logical thinking and decision making, we're really looking at testing your rational logic, not your memory. This is moreover looking at why. Give us what you think, but then back it up with why and support it with how. And the best way to do this is not only to give us your opinion, not only to give us your idea, but support it with research and references that exist out there. You're really making your best recommendation, and that is the tricky part about entrepreneurship. There really isn't a best answer. There's loads of answers. There's thousands of answers, and we need to choose one. So really, when we're decision making, when we're making our decisions, we're making it based on the information and resources that we have at that time. So we're trying to make the best decision we can, given the information and resources that we have at that time. And for this course, I cannot stress enough that it's incredibly important that you use references, references, references. All of the information that you give me, all of your opinions, all of your thoughts need to be validated with research and references. Without support of references, it literally is just an opinion. This leads us to what or who is an entrepreneur? Now, there are many different definitions of what an entrepreneur is, but at its most basic function, an entrepreneur is simply a business owner. Now, that's not to say, and, and please don't confuse entrepreneur with entrepreneurial, because entrepreneurial is behavioral, but an entrepreneur is an individual. And here we have a few definitions of different types of entrepreneurs, such as innovative, creating something new. You have opportunity seeking, which is taking something that already exists and making it better. Now, necessity-based entrepreneurs are those that start a business because they have to. And again, leading back to behavior, you know, are entrepreneurs averse to risk? Or do they have risk-taking behaviors? You have lifestyle entrepreneurs that create a business in order to suit their lifestyle. And a good friend of mine out in British Columbia creates snowboards during the summer season and then sells them in the winter season. That way he can snowboard while he's selling snowboards instead of having to make them while it's the winter season. You have income replacement replacement entrepreneurs that are the majority of entrepreneurs that exist on the planet. This is making, you know, full-time income. You're trying to make, you know, enough money to feed yourself, clothe yourself, put a roof over your head. Intrapreneurs is very interesting because this is entrepreneurial activity within a corporation or a company. So it's people, employees that are within a company that that take on this entrepreneurial behavior of creating something new or creating something, you know, adapting something that exists to make it better. And then last but not least, just to round it out, is we have social entrepreneurship, which is starting a business in order to create a greater good for society or the environment.
There are several myths when it comes to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. It's not the common dragon's den when you see people pitching for hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to try and you know, grow their company. Entrepreneurs are everyday people. They're all around us. You know, you might have family or friends that are entrepreneurs, that are business owners, right? Some of these myths are, they're visionaries. You know, they see into the future and that's just not true. They have better ideas than you do. Again, not really true. A big part of entrepreneurship and a big part of business creation is either, you know, taking something that somebody else is already doing and making it better or simply solving problems. What are some of the problems that you run into each and every day? Can you solve those problems? Well, if you can solve those problems and you know maximize that potential, other people might also have those problems. And if that's the case, then you might be able to commercialize that solution. Not all entrepreneurs are risk takers. Not all entrepreneurs are, have extraordinary forecasting ability. They don't see into the future. There is no crystal ball. Again, they are everyday people, right? So they're not unique and necessarily different than we are. And being born an entrepreneur, I mean, this, this is a very old argument in, in academia over 100 years now, you know, is an entrepreneur made or are they born? And to be honest with you, as I've always said, I think it's a combination of the two because I can teach you everything that there is to know about entrepreneurship. I can teach you everything that you need to know in order to reduce the risk of entrepreneurship. But what I can't teach you is to be okay with starting a business. I can't teach you to be okay with putting your life savings on the line. So again, I think it is a combination of the two because you do need that inherent drive, that inherent leap of faith in order to start a business. And then last but not least, entrepreneurs get all the breaks. And th this is just not the case. You'd be shocked as to the amount of hours an entrepreneur puts into their business every single day. It is very much a 24 seven job. In pages 11 through 13 in your textbook, you will find international entrepreneur traits. These are the things that drive international entrepreneurs. These are some of the things that drive entrepreneurs in general, which include embracing change, a desire to achieve, the ability to establish a vision. They do have a high tolerance of ambiguity, a high level of integrity, and individuals are important. I can also add through my research on exit and failure that the most successful entrepreneurs that I've been fortunate to interview are very good at adapting and they're very good at coping with whatever life throws at them. So who is the international entrepreneur? It's almost like a segue into James Bond, right? So we're not necessarily worried about the domestic entrepreneur right now, the one working at home or working in our home country. What makes the international and what makes the global point of an entrepreneur? So an international entrepreneur is the process of conducting business activities across national boundaries. So in other countries, part of this involves exporting, licensing, opening a sales office in another country, or posting a classified ad in another country. More information can be taken from page five in your textbook. When we're looking at the academic literature pertaining to international entrepreneurship, here are a couple of the topics that have emerged sales of new ventures, born global ventures, role of national cultures, and internationalization of small and medium enterprises. If I've sparked your interest now in entrepreneurship and what entrepreneurs are, who these people are, who these mysterious people are, there are three links here that you can select and fill out these quizzes to see just what kind of entrepreneur you are, what kind of person are you, especially as it pertains to entrepreneurial thinking. Now, if one of the results comes back that says you're not an entrepreneur at all, there's nothing wrong with that. OK, you don't have to be, you know, the best entrepreneur in the world. You don't have to be, you know, testing off the scales in entrepreneurial thinking or ability. It's just a measurement to show, you know, who you are as an individual. And remember, not everybody is is always forward facing. 
if we look at one of the famous companies ever to exist, Apple, the two founders, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the Woz was quite literally the engineering brain behind the whole mastery of Apple. Whereas Steve Jobs was that front facing, and let's let's call it what it is, sales individual, right? He he inspired people, he intrigued people, but it was Woz in the background that had to create this madness or this genius that you know Steve Jobs would manifest in his mind. So you can see even in that one simple example that entrepreneurship and business ownership takes all different types and kinds of people from all different backgrounds, beliefs. So when we're looking at the international component, internationalization really is entrepreneurial behavior that is oriented to create value and gain a competitive advantage. And we do this through discovery, enactment, evaluation, and the exploitation of opportunities. Differentiating domestic and international business further. Again, we're not even looking at entrepreneurship now. Let's just look at business in general, the macro level of business. Economics, so domestic systems, domestic countries, a singular country, deals with a singular system. Whereas international commerce, international business involves multiple systems. The world is at different stages of economic development. Is it a G7 country, G20 country? Is it emerging market? We also have different balance of payments, different currency exchanges, and types of economic systems, such as socialist, communist, democratic, autocratic, and last but not least, we have different political legal environments that exist all around the world that cause price fluctuations, they change costs, countries develop embargoes, they implement tariffs, right, and taxes against certain commodities. So countries behave differently from each other, which causes international market fluctuation. And really, we don't have these issues if we're only dealing within a domestic market within one country, such as the United Kingdom. International business becomes more complex. But don't let that scare you. Don't let that fool you. Don't let, don't let that worry you, right? The point of this class is to have a better understanding of how this international business works and how you as an individual or you as a company can enter these markets for whatever if you want to help the local economies if you're looking for simply profit there are different ways and and components to accessing these global marketplaces one of the best examples personal examples that i have of this is an individual that i interviewed a few years back uh, the individual was from sweden he owned his own manufacturing company in canada and at the pinnacle of this company, they were grossing about $23 million in profits. Now, the trouble is, when it came to the balance of payments, he was making purchases in euros, but he was selling in Canadian and US dollars. And what happened was, at one point, there was market fluctuation where the euro significantly dropped. Or conversely, if we, if we set up this example, even if Canadian and US dollars increased substantially, in either situation, when you are caught using other currencies, it can cause significant damage to the company in terms of you know, not getting the value for your money. For example, if I bought you know, a t-shirt in, in Canada with Canadian dollars, $100, it's only $100. However, if I bring over British pounds to Canada and the British pound is worth $1.20, then I'm actually getting a discount because the British pound is worth more. So I have more purchasing power. Well, in Lindgren Automation's scenario, they didn't get a discount. They had to pay more. And because of these costs, because of how much it costs, the inflation, they couldn't survive any further as a company and they ended up filing for bankruptcy. So this is just one example of how market fluctuations and currency exchanges can really impact international business.
Other factors that really differentiate domestic marketplaces from international business include the cultural environment. Now, there is a caveat, there is an exception to this as, you know, domestically, if we're looking at major cities such as London, Toronto, Vancouver, New York, right? They're very multicultural economies. They're very multicultural societies. That being the case, cultural culture in these major cities is very diverse. However, if we look at the country as a whole, typically culture isn't as diverse. And so in the domestic market, we can sometimes have homogeneity. Whereas in international markets, when we're dealing with different countries, say we're dealing with New Zealand, Peru, China, as well as Egypt, four very different cultures that are going to have different beliefs, different standards, and different ways that they conduct business. And this is something that we have to be aware of as a micro or small business looking to expand globally. You also have differences in technological environment, the environmental impact, right? If we're looking at the agricultural industry in Brazil right now with the increase of you know, cattle and, and ranching cattle, well, they're mowing down acres and acres and acres of the rainforest in order to do so. So although there is a human gain in terms of agricultural you know, livestock, there's a significant damage to the environment. So these are some of the things that we also have to be aware of when we are moving companies internationally. Even when we're operating domestically, we have to be aware of the social and environmental impact of our business. We also have local foreign competition, subsidies from foreign governments to try and encourage people to come to, you know, start a business in their country as well as personal motivations on why we might want to help or we might want to create a business in another economy. Here is a list of references used in today's presentation. So we made it through the first introduction. Hopefully you stick around for the rest of the semester. If not, it was great to chat with you for this first session. But that's international entrepreneurship. That's a sneak peek into what we're going to explore over the next 13 weeks. Thank you for tagging along. I really appreciate it. And stay tuned because we've got more great stuff coming up in the coming weeks.